Welcome to the Continuum Lab. If you've been following along uh, with the videos here on the channel, then you'll know that I make MIDI instruments. And you might also have noticed that I'm especially interested in electronic wind instruments. Let me tell you why. Before I became a maker, before the Continuum Lab or YouTube or any of this, I was a saxophone player for many years. And uh, so in this video, I'm going to share some of my uh, techniques with you that I've developed over the years, specifically how I write the code for woodwind keys. Now, you might not know this, but woodwind keys are actually kind of weird. First of all, they're not generally keys at all, but rather holes, like you can clearly see on this wooden whistle. So each note is produced by pressing a combination of keys or covering a combination of holes and uh, the role of each key then depends on what else is being pressed or not pressed at any given time. Now there is a logic to it of course, or rather physics. It has to do with the length of the tube and the air column inside it. Uh, the longer the tube, the lower the note basically. Except it's not quite that simple. Sometimes um, you skip holes to produce half steps. And weird key combinations might work depending on the specific instrument. But let's back up for a second. We're talking about MIDI instruments. So on a MIDI keyboard, for example, uh, each note simply has its own key and then you just press that key to produce that note. It's simple. But on a MIDI woodwind instrument, obviously that's not going to cut it. We're going to have to keep track of all of the closed and open keys and then have some way of reliably mapping different key combinations to different notes. So if you think that sounds crazy complex, it's really not. And the technique that I'm going to show you can easily be adapted to different instruments with different numbers of keys and notes. So let's get started. Okay, first of all, the hardware. Now, you might have seen me using one of these teensy microcontrollers uh, in most of my videos. I find it especially fantastic for making MIDI controllers because it has built-in functions for using MIDI over USB. But in order to keep these examples as universal as possible, I'll be adapting them to work both on an actual Arduino as well as on the teensy, which requires slightly different code. I'm using this Arduino Micro, but uh, there are more Arduinos out there which can do MIDI over USB. These are a few of them. So here's what we're doing. We'll be using a prototype ocarina to demonstrate these concepts. A super simple one with only four keys. Basically the simplest wind instrument worthy of the name. I've already put one together on this breadboard using the Arduino Micro. So because we're focusing strictly on how the code for the fingerings works, we're using buttons for keys, which makes for simpler code than if I were to use my preferred solution, the Teensy's capacitive sensors. Anyway, this Arduino doesn't have those sensors, so this is what we're doing. I've also substituted the breath sensor for a button, so that we can just press this to play a note, instead of setting up an analog breath sensor. That way we can concentrate on what I like to call the key logic. These button modules here come from my Continuum Lab instrument kit, but any old button would work just fine. The circuit is very, very simple. One side of each button goes off to the ground rail and the other side goes to the pins on the microcontroller. I'm using pins 18, 19, 20 and 21 for the keys and pin 22 for the extra breath sensor button. And that's the whole thing. You can literally put it together in a couple of minutes. So that's the Arduino circuit. But as you might know, if you've watched any of my videos, breadboards are not really my thing. So I've made a separate circuit for the Teensy board using the Continuum Lab instrument kit and my go-to prototyping material, corrugated cardboard. Let's have a look at that. As you can see, the Teensy LC goes in the click breakout board and everything else is plug and play. I'm using the same pins in the same order, but here each of the signal pins for the buttons has a handy ground pin right next to it, so connecting everything is even easier. The components are glued down onto the cardboard structure with hot glue, but they can easily be disassembled and reused in other projects once I'm done with this prototype. The cardboard structure makes it feel more like an actual instrument somehow with everything contained inside. 
In the next video in this series, we'll expand this concept to include an actual breath sensor as well. And we'll also add some more keys to test the flexibility of these techniques. I might even make one of these using the new Click2 electronics, taking advantage of the onboard synthesizers and audio. But um, today, this minimal setup and these bare bones prototypes are going to help us understand the basic concept and easily test it. So let's start with the Teensy prototype and then at the end of the video, I'll show you how to adapt the code to also use it with the Arduino setup. So let's get into the code. The first thing we need to do is define our keys in an array like this. So from now on, we can forget about the actual pin numbers and we simply refer to the keys by their array number, key zero, key one, etc. We'll also need to prepare these pins to be read digitally by setting their pin mode to input pull up. Next comes the main array where we define the key combinations for each note. Let's call this fingering array. This is a two-dimensional array where each subarray corresponds to a node, as you can see in the comment next to each line. The last element in each node array is the MIDI number for that node, and the other numbers describe a combination of pressed and not pressed keys. The number of node arrays corresponds to the full set of possible nodes that can be played, in this case 13. These arrays are read in two distinct phases and the number 100 is there as a marker to go to the next phase. This is important. Remember how the notes on a woodwind instrument are activated by a combination of pressed and non-pressed keys? Well, the places to the left of the first 100 element are the keys that need to be pressed to activate a certain note. And to the right of that, we find the keys that need to be open for that same node to be activated. You'll see how this works in a second when we get to the function that actually reads these arrays. So now we can move on to the actual functional loop. First, we need to read the buttons and insert the result of that reading into an array, which we can call pressed keys. A simple for loop takes care of that. This will make sure that each time around the loop, we have the latest combination of pressed keys to uh, compare to our node array. We also need to reverse the result of each reading because the buttons are connected through ground and so they read as zero when I press them. And I prefer it the other way around. And so now if the key is pressed, a one will be written to the array. Next we start the main logic loop which interprets the pressed and non-pressed keys. But first we need a couple of variables for that. Like I mentioned, we need to keep track of what point in the node array we're in. And uh, this key phase variable does that. The correct variable is used to keep track of whether or not our reading coincides with one of the node arrays. It starts out as zero, meaning that nothing has been confirmed yet. Finally, we need to keep track of the current node and the last node so that we only send a MIDI signal if the node has changed since the last time around the loop. And now we're ready. First, we open up a for loop with the same number of loops as the number of places in the fingering array. This will allow us to read through all of the node arrays until we find one that works. As you can see, we keep track of our place in this loop with the letter F for fingering, and we start each loop at key phase zero. Then inside that main loop, we go straight into another for loop, which has the same length as the individual node arrays. And this is where the action happens as we go through each node array. Here we'll keep track of our place using an N for node array. So let's try to run through that logic. We'll assume for this first test that we're not pressing any keys on the instrument. And that means that after reading all the buttons, the pressed keys array would now be full of zeros. So let's see what happens. First thing we do each time around the node array loop is look for the number 100. Because if we find that, we'll need to change the key phase. Right now, both F and N are zero. So we're reading the first position of the first node array. And indeed, what we find there is 100. So uh, we need to skip this part and go down here. Because the key phase is currently zero, we add one to it. So now it's one. Now we can go back to the start of the node array loop and read the next position in the current array. This time it's not 100. So we enter this if statement. In here we find two sections. The first one checks for pressed keys and the second one checks for non-pressed keys. Because we're now in key phase one, 
we want to check for non-pressed keys and we do that here. If the key at the current position is read as zero, then that confirms that this key is not pressed, which is what we're looking for in key phase one. So the correct variable is confirmed and we stay within this node array to check the rest of the keys. If on the other hand we had read a one on this position, then the current key is indeed pressed and so we could already tell that the current node array is not what we want. This would be great because it saves us the trouble of checking the rest of it and so this break statement here pushes us out uh, of this inner for loop so that we can immediately go on to check the next node array. In the case of not pressing any keys, this loops back all the way through the current node loop, uh, confirming each non-pressed key until we reach the next 100, which brings us back to here. But this time we're already in key phase one, so we reach this break statement, which takes us out of the current node array loop. And then because the correct variable is still set to one, we know that the current node array is the correct one. So we set the current node to whatever MIDI node is at the end of that array. And now we're actually done checking arrays. And so this break statement here takes us all the way out of the main fingering loop. And all that's left to do now is check if the node we just confirmed is different from the last node that we saved from the previous loop. And if it is, then we can send it out as MIDI. But before we do that, let's run through another example. For this one, let's actually press some keys. Let's say key number zero and key number two. Okay, so this time the first of the node arrays will quickly fail because on the second time around, it tells us that key zero should not be pressed and it is. So the correct variable here is set to zero and this break statement takes us out of that node array and back to the fingering array. This time, of course, F goes up by one. So now we start checking the next node array. This time around, we fail on the first loop because the array says that key number three should be pressed, but it's not. Again, we're sent back to the top of the fingering array to check the next node array. That also fails straight away because we're not pressing a key number one. The fourth time around the fingering array loop, we get a bit further because the first position in the node array is correct. Key number zero is in fact pressed. The second read changes the key phase and the third read confirms that key number one is not pressed. But on the fourth time around, we find that key number two should also not be pressed when in fact it is. The fifth node array loop fails on the second time through because we're not pressing key number three. But then in the sixth node array, we find what we were looking for. Key number zero is pressed and so is key number two. Then we change the key phase to check for non-pressed keys and keys number one and number three are indeed not pressed. So we're golden. Once we get to the final 100 in the node array and the key phase is already set to one, this break statement here will take us out of the node array loop. And then because each time around the loop has confirmed the correct variable to be one, we enter here where the current node is set to the MIDI node value at the end of the current node array. And once again, all that's left to do is check if the node that we found is different from the node from the last loop and if it is, then we send it out over MIDI. Notice that if we go through all of the checks and the combination of pressed keys doesn't match any of the node arrays, then we'll still get to this same point in the code. But in that case, of course, the correct variable will be zero. So no new node will be registered and no MIDI will be sent. There is one more thing to take care of, which I briefly mentioned at the beginning. Seeing as this is supposed to be a wind instrument, it really needs a breath sensor. Uh, now I have quite a few designs for breath sensors. They're not terribly hard to build or to code for, but uh, like I mentioned, today we're just going to be using another button. The important thing to keep in mind is that uh, we want to make sure that we only send a MIDI signal if the breath sensor is activated. And if it's not, then the keys don't really need to do anything at all. In fact, we don't even have to read them. So the way we do that is by wrapping this whole section in an if statement and then reading the breath sensor up here before we get to that. 
So only in the case that the breadth sensor reading is not zero, will we even get to the whole section of code that deals with the keys. Of course, if the breadth sensor has just been turned on or off in this most recent loop, then we also need to send a note on or note off message. And we're done. Let's connect our instrument. Uh, we can upload this code and then connect to a software synthesizer and see how it works. Sweet, the code works. As you can see, the uh, Teensy boards make it super easy to connect MIDI over USB. But let's see if we can't make this work with the Arduino Micro as well. Now, the uh, Micro connects using the same USB cable, so all we need to do is adapt the code. First of all, we have to include a specific library for MIDI over USB, like this. Include midiusb.h. But this library doesn't come standard with Arduino, so first we need to download it using the built-in Arduino Library Manager. Like that. Next, we need to insert a couple of functions which will make our simple MIDI messages work with this library. And then we can just change our MIDI function calls slightly, also including the flush command after each MIDI message. And that should be it. The rest of the code uses the same pins and does the same stuff that any old Arduino sketch does. So let's uh, connect the Arduino Micro. We'll upload this code and uh, see how everything works. Excellent, that also works great. And so that brings us to the end of this first demonstration. But let's be honest here, the ocarina is really kind of a weak example. I mean, think about it, with just four keys, we have a maximum of 16 possible key combinations and we're using 13 of those for our notes. So uh, we can almost always assume that any key that we're not pressing absolutely has to be left open or we'd probably just be playing another note. So what if we had more keys? Well, that would give us more possible key combinations, but we wouldn't necessarily want to have more notes. I mean, there's just 12 notes to an octave anyway, so that's generally the baseline. Ultimately, we'd have to make some more decisions, not just about the open and closed keys, but also if there are keys that we want to specifically ignore in the case of each note. All of that is going to be in the next video in the series where we'll pick up where we left off by designing some instruments with more keys and of course incorporating an actual breath sensor as well. Uh, we'll also talk about the thought process for designing the node arrays and we'll get into some ways of making this code more universal so that it can easily be adapted to different kinds of instruments with different numbers of keys. So stay tuned for that. Take care until next time and I'll see you in the continuum.